Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Today we're getting an inside look at Oklahoma State University's wheat breeding program. We begin inside the milling lab with SUNUP's Austin Moore. It is easy to look at harvest as the finish line for a wheat crop. But the fact is, combines arrive somewhere in the middle of the process that delivers bread to our tables. This is something that humans eat and depend on uh, for our daily diet. I mean, it's 20% of our protein and essentially 20% of our calories are coming from wheat. I spoke with wheat breeder Brett Carver in the milling lab of the Food and Ag Products Center here at Oklahoma State University. We spend just as much time on data produced in this laboratory as we do with data produced in the field. It's the ultimate disappointment to have a beautiful wheat in the field that has great disease resistance, unbelievable yield potential, but it does not have the potential to meet the demands of the baker and the, or the consumer. The process starts with the team looking at the kernels, measuring size and hardness before milling the grain to extract flour. Now, we talk about soft versus hard, but there's, there are still different grades, different finer levels of hardness. So a, a softer hard wheat, which we would still find acceptable uh, for processing and commercial uh, baking, allow us to uh, generate a little bit higher flour yield because the mill is just scraping that flour a little bit better off the bran. This is also where they look at protein, both the amount contained in the kernel and the quality of that protein. Well, when we talk about the, the kind or the quality of protein, uh, we, we break that down into about three categories. The first is what kind of dough properties can we achieve uh, from a certain kind of protein and, and that protein in wheat is really 80% gluten. So 80% uh, of the protein is gluten. So dough properties are very important but in addition to that we're looking at the finished product so the loaf volume is very important and then in terms of what that loaf appears uh, inside we refer to that as the, the crumb structure. So we're looking at the aerated structure of the inside of the loaf, uh, some characteristics that the baker would be looking for. We look at the same characteristics in this laboratory. This machine is called a mixograph. It forms the dough and measures its properties, beginning with the time for peak development. We don't want a very long mixing time, but then we don't want a very short mixing time. Long mixing times require more energy in the bakery. Energy is a very costly part of the baking process. However, a very short mixing time where this part of the graph would be shorter generally tends to tell us we have a, short, a, a weak dough. So strength is not there. Okay, now look at the other part of the curve, the descending part. This is where the dough continues to be mixed beyond its peak development. So we're over mixing it. We're applying more energy than it really needs. So we're looking at the strength of the dough and in, in relative to over mixing. Here we want a fairly flat curve and a wide curve. That tells us something about extensibility, something about strength. And that's what they're striving for here. A dough that blends strength and extensibility, which is the ability to be stretched. So strength allows uh, the dough to contain the fermentation gases uh, during proofing. That's very important, you gotta contain the gases. But the extensibility allows that dough to rise during baking. So we want that balance of strength and extensibility and the mixograph helps us determine that. If you'd like to see an extended version of my conversation with Dr. Carver and take a closer look at this lab, please visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. From the milling lab, we wanted to step next door to the baking lab here at the Food and Agricultural Products Center. We're joined by Renee Nelson, our milling and baking specialist, to kind of set up a demo and talk about the end product a little bit. And you've got a demonstration here with some different loaves of bread. Why don't you just start off in general telling us what you have set up here? Okay. I took three different types of flour. I took bread flour, all-purpose flour, and pastry flour and I bake them the same exact way I followed the AACC method, the serial chemistry approved method. And I, you can see the difference in what the protein level has in the different flours. 
This was bread flour. It usually contains 10 and a half percent higher, maybe to 12 percent protein. And all purpose is could be nine and a half up to 11. Maybe it would stop at 10 and a half percent. A lot of the mills have their own little standards. And this would be pastry flour having less than 9% protein. And it shows that the more protein you have, the, the higher, the taller loaf, the more protein a flour has, the more it can hold the gases that the yeast produce. Where you can see where the pastry flour doesn't have a lot of protein, and so as it rows, it, it can't hold together and it just collapses and falls apart. And obviously, with this this loaf, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's some obviously differences right here in the top, mm -hmm. and so it it kind of all relates to this um, gluten I've um, I've extracted out. So this was the gluten taken out of the bread flour. You can see how strong and stretchy it is, and that's indicative indicative of having more um, protein where the all-purpose, there's still some stretch and strength, but just not quite as much as there is in the bread. And that's the one from the pastry flour. There, there's not a large quantity there, and you can tell by it's just not quite as strong. And that caused the, the holes in the top of the bread. Okay. Now, looking at the individual slices that you've made from loaves of bread here, what did they tell you? You want long, uh, elongated cells, kind of lacy and elegant cells. That means that the bread could stretch and hold together. Um, one doesn't want uh, lots of little tiny holes and thicker cell walls. It makes for a, a different eating experience and different quality. Now, Renee, you've also uh, baked some cookies for us, which I must say I'm pretty excited to take a look at. Um, using the different flowers. Tell us what we have. Okay, so we have chocolate chip cookies, the Nestle Toll House recipe. Classic recipe. <laughs> yes, with pastry flour, this, this one, all-purpose flour, and bread flour. And it's more of an eating experience when one bites through. The, the bread flour cookies, they have the more gluten, they'll probably be crispier, a little tougher, chewier also. The all-purpose is probably what we're all used to eating, and the pastry flour will be very delicate, melt-in-your-mouth, soft cookie. So the pastry flour, is this sort of the ideal flour that uh, companies would use? Mm -hmm. it, pastry flour would kind of be the gold standard to make cookies, but more and more we're seeing bakeries use all different types of flours to get a different type cookie, and so we're kind of getting away from, from that. So it's kind of anyone's ball game with whatever recipe they want to come up yes. with to get the desired results? Yes. Okay. Renee, this is great information, but I have to say these are even better cookies. <laughs> so thanks for your time today. Renee Nelson, our milling and baking specialist. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mezzanet Weather Report. Rain and snow came to visit us again early this week. The Mezzanet recorded rainfall on Tuesday and snow melt on Wednesday. This combination of moisture was captured in a two-day rainfall map from Wednesday evening. Every Mezzanet station recorded some moisture, although the folks in Boys City might argue that one hundredth of an inch doesn't really count. The highest recorded precipitation was at Mangum, one and nine hundredths inches. South and east of a line from Mangum to Oklahoma City to Ponca City, precipitation came in the form of rain, while snow fell mostly north and west of this line out to Guymon. The white colored accumulated snowfall really shows up in a visible satellite view captured noon Wednesday. The snow stretched from the Texas Panhandle across northwest Oklahoma and on into south central Kansas. Kingfisher was one of those sites with rain and snow that provided seven tenths of an inch of water. 
a time series chart for Kingfisher for 12 hours on Wednesday includes air temperature in red, snow melt in green, and sunlight in orange. The red air temperature chart includes a blue 32 degree freeze line. The Mesonet Kingfisher rain gauge begins recording snow melt close to 11 in the morning, just before the air temperature goes above freezing. By 2 in the afternoon, the air temperature has risen above 40 degrees and the snow melt accelerates until all of the snow in the Mesonet rain gauge is melted just before 4 in the afternoon. You can access graphs like these for each Mesonet site by going to Station Mediagrams on the Mesonet weather page. For the early spring fire season, approaching quickly, the Keech Byram Drought Index helps monitor soil dryness. The areas of concern are those with values above 500, colored red or purple on the map. The reddish purple areas on our Keech Byram Drought Index map from Wednesday have values above 600. Buffalo is the driest spot at 683. Checking in on a Climate Prediction Center outlook for February 19th to the 23rd indicates Oklahoma will have an increased chance of above normal moisture. Western and central Oklahoma fall in the 33 percentile band, while eastern Oklahoma is in the band with a 40 percent chance of above normal precipitation. Looking a little farther out from February, 21st to the 27th, the chance of above normal precipitation is predicted to be higher with the majority of the state in the 40 to 50 probability range. While these forecasts are a ways out and don't indicate how much moisture above normal we might receive, it's encouraging to see chances for above normal precipitation as we enter the final days of February. Thanks for watching and we look forward to being with you again for another Mesonet weather report. Joining us once again is our grain marketing specialist, Kim Anderson. Now, Kim, today we've been in the baking lab, we've been in the milling lab, and really taking a look at what protein and, and quality protein in wheat means towards the flour and that end product. But while we see there's some value to be added there and captured, how do producers do that? Well, as individuals, they probably cannot capture that increased value for the protein. Now, if they store on farm and they merchandise that wheat, there's the potential to do that. But the way you capture that uh, return, that value of the wheat, is to produce it at a market as a whole. In other words, the state of Oklahoma produces a good, high quality, high milling quality wheat, good protein, then the market's going to pay the state a premium for that wheat. You'll see that in the basis. So as an individual, probably not going to cap capture it. But as a state, as a market area, you can capture that higher value. All right, now let's move up to Kansas City Board of Trade this week. Uh, the wheat contract broke through resistance. Let's talk about what's happening there. Well, watching that July contract, you can watch the March either one. Both of them broke that strong resistance point that uh, we talked about the last couple of weeks. Let's talk about $8 for that uh, July contract, or $7.98 if you want to be precise. We're trading right below that. If we stay below that, say through Tuesday of next week, then we're possibly going to go down another 50 cents. Breaking that, you're really into no man's land, and there's a potential if we get timely rains of maybe uh, dropping a dollar off this market. If we go back above, then we can gain back 50 cents. But I'm really concerned about what's going on with the uh, prices right now. Okay, also in the news this week, uh, there's a lot of talk about corn. What's happening with that crop? Well, you read a lot on corn. Uh, they're talking about uh, over 99 million acres of corn being planted. You know, you can go back seven or eight years and we had 77, 78 million acres of corn. So that's a lot of corn. You can just have a say 147 bushels per acre. They talk about the trend line being around 165. And you look at ending stocks on uh, July 31 of uh, 2014, you're talking about going from about 600 million bushels to maybe 1.4 billion bushels. And some analysts are saying that we could have 2 billion bushels of any stocks. 
we have a corn crop like that, you're going to have a lot lower corn prices. Right, and what is that going to then translate to the wheat crop, which is what, of course, we have here to worry about? Well, I think we've probably got, oh, 70, 75 cents in the wheat price. That's because of corn, keeping wheat from going into the feed market. You lower corn prices, you're going to lose that 75 cents on wheat prices. All right, good information. As always, Kim Anderson, our great marketing specialist. Trichomoniasis is a reproductive disease of cattle that we used to think of as, as only being a problem in those states where there was government lands, where there was a lot of communal grazing, where several herds were run in the same area throughout the course of the breeding season, and therefore bulls from, from different operations were being mated with cows from, from several different herds. Well, as time moves forward, we find out that trichomoniasis actually becomes a bigger problem in some of our herds here in Oklahoma, where we're doing just uh, normal reproductive programs with uh, turning bulls out into the pastures with the cows. With that in mind, back in uh, 2011, on the first day of that year, a new rule went into effect in, in our state, whereby bulls that were changing hands had to be tested to see if they were carriers of this reproductive disease. And with that new rule, then uh, we started to identify potential carriers of trichomoniasis and could remove them from, from our herd populations in Oklahoma. With me today is Dr. Rod Hall with the uh, Oklahoma Department of F Agriculture, Food and Forestry. He is our state veterinarian. And Dr. Hall has, has helped us a lot with understanding the, the new rule that came into effect in 2011 on uh, how uh, bulls need to be tested. And we thought it'd be good for him to kind of review today what that rule is and to give us a little idea of, of what changes you've seen in the last couple of years. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, Glenn. Uh, the, the new rule did go into effect uh, January 1, 2011. Uh, the, the disease itself is, as you said, it's a disease that spread uh, only in breeding cattle. Bulls are the, uh, are the sex that does keep the disease active and, and once they're infected, uh, they remain infected for life. Uh, female cattle can become infected and they can infect uh, a clean bull, but uh, they normally get rid of the disease after they've been through several heat cycles. We worked together with OSU Cooperative Extension Service. We really worked hard to try to educate producers and I, I'm, I was real pleased with the way that went. Uh, in 2011, we tested in the state approximately 7,300 bulls for trichomoniasis. And of those 7,300, we had 151 positive, which is a 2.1% infected rate. Uh, the majority of those bulls, or, or about half of them, were in about 10 counties in the northeastern corner of the state, but, but it was spread throughout the state. We, we saw it from, not from every county, but from every, every section of the state. Uh, so we were interested to see, we, we didn't make any changes from 2011 to 2012 in the rules. We were interested to see what would happen, and in 2012, uh, we tested a few more bulls, so around 74, 7,500. We had 101 positive bulls for a 1.4% infection rate. So, so we decreased 0.7%. Uh, uh, once again, uh, over half the bulls that were positive were in that northeastern corner of the state. And, and actually 28 of those bulls were from one herd that, that had a really bad problem with it. Uh, so, so we felt like we made some progress. It, it, you know, anyone who had any statistics statistics classes knows that uh, you can't base anything on two years statistics but it does look like we're making some progress I think the best thing we've done is to educate our producers we, we have many more people now who know about the disease who are, are aware of the the way they can get the disease uh, and, and I I hope that, that because of that, we'll continue to see a decline in, in the incidence of the disease here in Oklahoma. Very good. Can you just remind the producers what's involved with testing a bull for, for trichomoniasis? Okay. Sure. Yeah, the test involves uh, getting a sample uh, of, the, of the bull's, uh, what we call smegma, 
which is just the material that collects in the prepuce of the bull. Uh, this is not a disease that gets uh, into the animal system, so it can't be tested with a blood test or anything. The only test is uh, either a culture or a test called a PCR for the DNA of the organism that causes it. So uh, the veterinarian has to go in, uh, usually with a, with a pipette about 18 or 24 inches long, and kind of scrape the lining of that, of that sheath of the bull, and at the same time, put some negative pressure on that and, and try to suck a little bit of that material that's in there into the pipette. That material then is transferred to a, uh, a pouch of growth media that allows the organism to start growing and reproducing, and it is then transferred to the laboratory uh, where the testing is actually done. Well, I think that uh, we've shown uh, with Dr. Hall's help that they're making real progress in terms of trying to reduce the incidence of trichomoniasis here in Oklahoma. I certainly encourage producers uh, as they're uh, marketing bulls to continue to have those bulls uh, tested. And if you have any problem in terms of reproduction in your herd, visit with your local veterinarian and perhaps ask about whether the bulls that you have on your place need to be tested for trichomoniasis to see if this is the problem why you may have more open cows th than you would expect. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. And now a quick update on crop insurance sign-up from our Ag Policy Specialist, Jody Campici. The 2008 Farm Bill was extended, uh, as most of you know, and with that, the Acre and DCP program were also extended into the 2013 crop year. The sign-up for those two programs starts on February 19th. One key uh, important thing to note about it is that in the 2008 Farm Bill, producers who enrolled in the Acre program had to remain in Acre for the life of the Farm Bill. They couldn't go back and choose DCP the next year. With this 2013 sign-up, though, they're allowing producers to choose Acre or or DCP regardless of what they were enrolled in previously. One option is they can enroll in DCP and then in May if we find out more information and it looks like Acre may be a better option they can actually opt out of DCP and then enroll in Acre before the June 3rd Acre sign up deadline. If you'd like to view Jody's complete comments visit our website sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk a little bit about thread lubricant and, uh, and places that it can be used. What we have here is Never Seize, and uh, it's an anti-seize compound that you put on different things to keep them from uh, basically rusting together or seizing together. Maybe you want to put it on, uh, on, a, on a spark plug that might be going into an aluminum head where the threads don't, uh, uh, might have a tendency to bind together. Another good example is, for example, a, a fuel injector. Before you insert your fuel injector in your head, if you would coat the outside of this with some uh, anesthesia compound before you stick it in, it'll, when you get ready to remove it again, if you have to reset the pressures on it, why it'll be a, easier to remove at that point in time. So we've talked about uh, thread lock in the past. Now we're talking about something that makes it a little easier to come apart. When, uh, when it comes time to take it apart. So there's a little tip to keep things from getting rusted together or seized together. So we'll see you next time on Shop Stop. Finally today, training the fire experts of tomorrow. Sunup intern Samantha Smith has this story. The snaps, crackles and sights of fence-high flames is not an uncommon scene at the OSU Range Research Station this time of year. Students in the Advanced Prescribed Fire course at OSU are here to gear up and start some fires. This lab today is just one of the activities or part of the class that's required that they come through this, learn, become familiar with all the, the fire equipment that we have, 
Uh, we go over how to operate it safely, how to do it, talk about safety aspects of it. And then we go out in the field a little bit and burn because part of the requirements in class is for them to go on at least five burns during the semester out in the field. And so this is just a part of our policy and part of the class that they go through this. But talking about fire isn't the only thing they do. These students get practical experience by applying the fire themselves. It's, it's very important to have this, this out of the classroom, hands-on stuff with fire. Because again, we can talk about fire all we want, but actually going out into the field and actually allowing the students to implement it and to be a part of it uh, is very big. It takes that nervous edge out of somebody who's never experienced or may be nervous about this. It gives them the opportunity to slowly get used to it to where they're comfortable at doing it safely. You know, it's a very controlled environment like John talked about for these guys to really um, take on what a controlled burn is, get time to stop, watch, and study fire behavior and see it rather than showing them a video where they can see somewhat of a general idea. It's time for them to get their feet on the ground and experience that. That way when they leave here or they leave this class, they are taking that full experience. And this hands-on experience is what sets OSU graduates apart. A lot of the natural resource agencies, whether they're state or federal, are looking for students that know how to do this correctly and properly. And that's what here at OSU and in our natural resource college and management program with our fire that we've got puts them well ahead of everybody else in the region. I feel that I've gained skills in more areas than just setting fire and farther, going farther into areas of fire behavior, um, studying fuel characteristics, studying wildfire potential. Um, and that's one thing that every one of those students is going to be able to pick up that goes through here. We have a lot of people, a lot of students come back and tell me about how they, one of the reasons they got their jobs was their fire experience they got from these courses. That does it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.